Coming up on this edition of Out of the Blue from Middle Tennessee State University. We introduce you to a physics professor whose research has earned her recognition as one of the nation's top young faculty members. We explore a biology professor's efforts to bring research opportunities and two federally funded projects to undergraduates. And we check out the work by a history professor whose class uses the latest digital storytelling skills to explore Nashville neighborhoods. I'm Andrew Ottman, and this is Out of the Blue. Welcome to Out of the Blue. I'm Andrew Ottman. Assistant Professor Hannah Terleska in our Department of Physics and Astronomy was one of the first two MTSU professors to be recognized by the National Science Foundation as one of the nation's top young faculty members. She joins us today via Zoom to talk about her research, her love of teaching, and the importance of inspiring young women to pursue careers in science. Professor, welcome to Out of the Blue. Thank you very much. We are so very proud of your achievement, but I, I, I hope I could get you to describe the honor you've received from the National Fa uh, Science Foundation and what that means not only to you personally, but to our university. I, together with another faculty from MTSU, uh, Seth Jones from Educational Department, we both got the first MTSU NSF Career Awards. Uh, for my research, it will help me to further continue to do cutting edge uh, research in quantum materials, uh, educate students and promote women in science and STEM. And for MTSU, I think this shows that uh, how successful uh, the efforts have, that have been taken by administration, department chairs, dean, president, have been towards the mov moving towards the research direction, promoting research infrastructure at MTSU. Let's talk about first the topic uh, that you're going to be exploring thanks to this this grant. What uh, Describe your project and uh, make it so that, that hosts of television programs can follow along. Uh, this NSF will fund the research on this quantum material. So this is computational and theoretical study of novel materials. They don't happen in nature naturally. They are man-made in, uh, in the labs. But uh, they have very exotic and fascinating properties. And most importantly, they can have a useful application in various technologies. So we can use these quantum materials to build better batteries, to build better and efficient computers and electronics, also the solar cells. And in particular, my research will be on so-called high temperature superconductors. So for example, if you have uh, cables that bring electricity or current to you or to your homes, right, to bring light into your homes, when you touch the cables, it's kind of hot. Right, because we look, uh, we lose energy due to the heat. But superconducting cables, when you heat them to very low temperatures, they can conduct electricity with the, without any loss of energy. Okay? And imagine having this, these superconducting cables all over the United States. We will get a lot of energy for basically for, for with very little cost. We do use them already in MRI in medicines. We use them in energy transmission in storage. We use them already in, for example, in Germany and in, in Japan for transformation uh, for tra uh, transportation. I, I want to key on a, an important element of this. When the provost came to my office and, and talked about you and Professor Jones, not only was this a, a great honor for your research, but also uh, there was this recognition of you being so young in your career, uh, so uh, getting this almost out of the gates. And you've been at MTSU for about two and a half years. Talk about what this means to get this so early in your, in your academic career. Yeah, it's very exciting. I, I, in the beginning, I didn't believe that I got it. <laughs> uh, but it, it's huge encouragement because this will help me so much to pursue my career goals, research career goals. Since coming to MTSU, I established three different collaborations with different groups in Oak Ridge, continue collaboration with the University of Michigan, with Florida State, with Louisiana State, with a recent collaboration with University of Augsburg in Germany. And this helps me to go and promote my research and also to promote MTSU. So let's talk about how you found us on the map. Uh, how did you 
find Middle Tennessee State University and how did this come into one of your career aspirations? I was looking for the place where I can be a researcher and also uh, do a teaching. I wanted to be this teaching research scholar and I find that this is a perfect match. And the more I go, uh, the more years I, I, I'm here, the more I see that I can, I'm a good fit here. And I myself is a, I am a first generation student. And I met all my students, maybe 95% that I mentored are first generation students, okay? And, and just seeing them, how they transition, you know, from very shy and undetermined what to do and to, oh, I'm gonna to do this, I'm gonna to apply and I'm gonna to present research, I'm gonna to apply for graduate school or I'm gonna to participate in this conference. This is just remarkable, you know? And just, just to see how their lives are changed, how I can, my little help can help them and their families to pursue the things they might not even probably have considered before. And I love the fact that you, you, you picked us because you, not only for the research opportunities, but for the opportunity to touch and teach others. And I, um, I got to see you in action myself uh, as part of Expanding Your Horizons, EYH, which is our outreach to middle school girls about careers in, in, in science. And uh, uh, I, I saw some of your amazing uh, projects that you were doing to kind of fascinate and captivate them. Talk about the importance of giving back in that way, encouraging young women to think about and pursue scientific careers. So as you know, uh, women in STEM is a big problem of having women in STEM and physics and engineering in particular. In physics, it's like 10 or 15 percent uh, are females. Like I'm the only female tenure track faculty in my, uh, my, our department. And when I came here and I saw like we have like 30 or 35 percent of our undergraduates are females. I'm like, what do we do with them? Yeah. So I decided, OK, let's organize a women in physics group. Now every year we have this, uh, due to Judith Gross uh, uh, from a chemistry department, we do this, uh, we started to do physics workshop for middle and high school students and every, way, every year we improve our presentation. And what, what is very fascinating to me actually, I see that students who are presenting after the presentation, they are so happy. Actually, they are happy because they see that what they do has effect on high school and middle students, and they want more students, a female student in STEM. Uh, so we also, what we also do, uh, we bring our undergraduate female students from Women in Physics group to conference for undergraduate women in physics. This is a huge conference nationwide, nationwide in different uh, different location uh, in United States. And I found that this has really, really big impact on our students. So first year when I was here, I brought my first uh, uh, MTSU female students with me to a conference to um, uh, University of Virginia. And most importantly, after listening to these high profile talks, uh, women with uh, very successful women and these talks and very interesting talks, they actually got encouraged. They literally changed after coming from the conference, before going to the conference, none of them wanted to go to graduate school. But after coming from the conference, their, their focus actually shifted. Both of them applied to graduate school um, one of them is Kristen Barton. I'm so proud of this. This is my first student, undergraduate student, MTSU. So now she's doing Department of Energy Research in Los Alamos lab, which is fascinating. And she will probably become a data, science, uh, a data scientist in one day. Well, Professor, this is just wonderful to hear all of these great pursuits and all this great mentoring and all of your achievements both in the field of science, but also working with their students and, and encouraging young women to pursue science. We appreciate you coming on the program via Zoom and sharing all this with our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And we'll be right back. Your MTSU Alumni Association has a goal of placing this pin on the lapel of all those who call this campus theirs. Let's pass that tradition on. Let's pass it on. You know you gotta climb high I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, 
I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I'm engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner. Now, in forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. Pass the tradition on. Pass the tradition on. Pass it on. Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. Remember, storm clouds will make a way for the sun, and the darkest of nights become a new day. We look forward to a return to normalcy and seeing our students talking, laughing, creating a purely human connection, and we will emerge stronger than ever before. We look forward to the moment when we welcome all of you home to MTSU. Welcome back to Out of the Blue. I'm Andrew Oppmann. Professor Mary Ferrone in our Department of Biology has secured federal funding for two microbiology projects. Now that alone would be big news, but what makes it even more special is how she's going to great lengths to include undergraduate students in this work, giving them experiences normally reserved exclusively for graduate students at other institutions. She joins us today via Zoom to talk about these projects. Professor, welcome to Out of the Blue. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's, our, it's our honor to have you on Zoom on this special program. I'm so very excited to talk about these topics because uh, as the uh, parent of a, uh, of a biology major myself, I, I, I understand how valuable having undergraduate research opportunities are for the recruitment of top students. So walk us through these two projects, uh, both federally funded. Let's describe a little bit about what they are, where the money's coming from, and what you're hoping to accomplish. Okay, well, uh, the first one is an NIH-funded project, and it, it deals with a couple of novel bacteria that we discovered and named several years ago. And these organisms are unique in that, you know, first of all, they're bacteria, but they live inside of a cell, much like a virus does. And not only that, they make their way all the way to the nucleus of the host cell and divide and replicate in there. And that, that's a unique niche. Uh, it also ends up in the death of the cell. So what we're studying right now is how, how do those bacteria make their way all the way to the nucleus? That project was funded by the NIH, right? The National Institutes of Health? Right, the National Health? Institutes of Health, yes. Wonderful. And the project actually began as an EPA-funded project where we were looking for organisms out in, in the environment uh, and trying to compare levels of these infectious bacteria in natural versus human-constructed environments. And that project involved a lot of undergraduate researchers. There was a lot of screening going on for, that, for the initial stages of this project. And then the second project is a USDA, Department of Ag Agriculture project, correct? Yes, and that one has to do with food safety as well. And again, bacteria that tend to live and hide inside their host cells, which allows them to escape the immune system and the actions of antibiotics. And so these are organisms like E. coli and Shigella. Uh, and so we're still trying to figure out how are they still persisting on fresh produce or in bags of lettuce from the from the markets. So if I'm an undergraduate student, what are the what are the types of things that I'm doing in, in either of these projects? What kind of work am I engaged with in, in, in making these projects happen? For the NIH project, one thing that the undergraduates begin with are learning how to cultivate uh, both the bacteria and the cells in which they grow because these bacteria will not just grow on regular microbiological media. So we first train you on doing what we call aseptic technique, how to work very sterilely with cells and with the bacteria. Uh, and then we begin projects, and we have a, an array of projects. For instance, one of the undergraduates right now is trying to study uh, if the bacteria come out of one cell type does that make them more infectious for another different cell type? So 
These organisms might infect the cells of your lungs. Uh, if so, can they make the jump from cells of the lungs to cells that might be in the bloodstream? One of the selling points that MTSU uh, has in reaching great students, you're doing the kind of work that at other universities are, are reserved for graduate students, but you're doing that as an undergraduate. Talk to me what this means to the career aspirations and potentials of your, of your students. Well, to be working on a federally funded grant is a, is a big plus because that means these projects are what, what our U, U.S. government has deemed as important and relevant to research. But more importantly, they gain a lot of independence, they gain a lot of confidence, and they learn so many new techniques that they might not be able to acquire in the laboratories um, for teaching. You know, even though we do a lot of these techniques, they get to do them over and over again, hopefully not too many times, so that they really become masters of these projects and these techniques. Well, Professor, I, I, you, you talked about learning new processes, and uh, I know you have had to, because of the COVID-19 situation, learn some new processes about instruction uh, and maybe taking your courses in directions you never anticipated. Walk me through what you've learned and seen uh, from your students during the new delivery of instruction? Uh, at first, I was a little bit worried that they, that I might not be able to keep up with the technology, but, uh, but I've, I've learned to present, especially because my courses are very lab, lab heavy, uh, to pre present the material in different ways so that I can appeal or, you know, they're, they're seeing images of things instead of holding their hand and them in their hands in the laboratory. But yet they're being flexible, they haven't complained, and they're, they're using everything I give them to try to get all the information. Let's uh, take a step back and talk about the building that you, uh, that you teach and do research in, our science building. Uh, how much of a game changer has that facility been in your work and, and how does it help in the and not only getting great research done, but also in great teaching. I think it's made a lot of difference. Uh, it's opened up a lot more room for us to do work and accommodate uh, more students. We've been able to expand our microbiology labs to three hours, like many of our other labs, whereas in our old space, we had one room for all the microbiology labs, both upper and lower divisions. So. Um, this has given us the opportunities to even expand the courses that we offer because of the space. That's incredible. It's incredible to see it in action by uh, professors like you and students as well. Well, I know we're, we're into the summer and uh, it sounds like this research is going to continue on in the summer, right? I mean, you don't stop. You don't take a summer break, right? No, we don't stop over break. We keep going, um, even trying to get a little bit done now. Uh, but yeah, we are we are all year long, and you know these are living living organisms, and so they need to be taken care of as well. Well, pr Professor, it means so very much to us to, to to hear about these great opportunities you're offering to students, but also uh, just to check in with you and to see that you're doing well and uh, uh, that you're staying on course and everything's going okay. We we appreciate you joining us on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. And we'll be right back. Your MTSU Alumni Association has a goal of placing this pin on the lapel of all those who call this campus theirs. Let's pass that tradition on. Let's pass it on. You know you gotta come high. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I'm engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner, now in forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue.
Pass the tradition on. Pass the tradition on. Pass it on. Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. Remember, storm clouds will make a way for the sun, and the darkest of nights become a new day. We look forward to a return to normalcy and seeing our students talking, laughing, creating a purely human connection. And we will emerge stronger than ever before. We look forward to the moment when we welcome all of you home to MTSU. Welcome back to Out of the Blue. I'm Andrew Ottman. Bygone Nashville is a terrific website that uses multimedia storytelling skills to explore the history of Nashville neighborhoods. It was created through the work of Assistant Professor Molly Taylor Poleski in our Department of History. Now she teaches digital history in the College of Liberal Arts. The professor joins us via Zoom with one of her students, Audrey Creel, to talk about this project. Well, welcome both of you to the program. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. It means so much to have you on this Zoom edition of Out of the Blue. Well, Professor, I, I've got to tell you as a content geek myself, I, I love your website. This is a rich, interesting site with a lot of great things to explore. Talk about how it got created, why it got created, and, and what you're trying to accomplish with it. This website was created almost completely by undergraduate students in my um, digital public history class. And the beauty of doing public history is that it's not topic specific. You can really delve into new topics, whatever is pertinent to that locality. So with the students in this class, I try and bring that to our appreciation of our local surroundings again. And I start the class with just observations. And Audrey can tell you a little bit more about those experiences of listening, looking, observing things that we don't normally see on the landscape. Audrey, she kind of sets you up for the next question I'm going to ask, which is, how do you, how do you get at the layers of this, this, uh, this type of storytelling? It really just started by walking East Nashville. Um, I wasn't very familiar with the area, and um, most of the places that I ended up writing about were just places that I found while I was walking, and uh, it kind of piqued my interest, and I wanted to learn more about it. I started with newspaper research. It gives you a good personal look at the areas that you're trying to research, as well as other secondary sources that might explain why a building looks the way it does um, and how that can contribute to a broader narrative of um, United States history or even world history. Can you describe from our viewers your project? You've mentioned East Nashville. Tell us what you're, what you're, what you're diving into in that particular area. Our class last semester um, looked at um, East Nashville just as a region, uh, and we were each assigned a specific block um, that each student was researching. And so we picked three or four buildings within that block that we researched. Um, and these buildings uh, were anything from old houses that dated to early 1800s to a shopping mall at one point. And so we were able to take all that research um, for our individual plots and then find common themes, um, stuff like religious history in Nashville started coming up or architectural history, um, tribal history even. And so we started taking those themes that were applied in different ways and used that to create um, a public walking tour that we led at the end of the semester. Wow. Wow. Professor, I, I, I'm really intrigued on how you begin this process. You are, you're, you're in a lot of ways like a magazine editor. How do you go through the idea process of finding uh, what you're going to tackle in a semester's class, what kind of variety you're going to put up, and, uh, and really honing down on the topics you're going to explore? I like to focus on a micro section and that's why I break it down even smaller as Audrey mentioned she got a block or a street to focus on because sometimes if you read secondary sources you don't know how to read the city itself so as I mentioned before I focus on observation something as simple as a deviation in how a street lines up may actually tell you about an important historical decision that was made in the development of that city. And that, I think, is nowhere more obvious than in East Nashville. We're seeing um, 
gentrification, yes, but an incredible um, turnover in the way that East Nashville looks because of the recent tornado. And of course, natural disasters are not new to East Nashville. That was one of the, the stories that the students in this class kept turning up floods and tornadoes and fires, all of the different ways that East Nashville's history has changed over time. And now I think for the next class, we can move on to a new neighborhood and I'm looking to move on to North Nashville. Wow, wow. Well, um, your professor did a good job setting you up, uh, Audrey, for the next question, which is talk about the Nashville Sites uh, project she mentioned and your work in that and, and what you're learning from those opportunities. Yeah. they are uh, located in Nashville and they are heading up um, a really great website and program in Nashville to um, establish certain tours um, that are all self-guided, but they don't have any tours located in East Nashville right now. And so um, what they have asked me to do is take all the stories that have been written for the Bygone Nashville project and help kind of consolidate that into a walking tour. Did you have any idea uh, when you were signing up for this class that this is, this is, the, this is the work that you were gonna be doing and, and we're entering registration? Would you recommend this to prospective students? Um, yeah, I would absolutely recommend uh, this course to other students. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but it has been so helpful in helping me take all the research that you have to do, um, even for, I think our stories are only 400 words a piece, but it's still mountains of research that you have to do. And how do you take all that, that research and um, make it easy to read and tell a full story and uh, make it available to the public? And so that has been very helpful um, to uh, what I am hoping to do after graduation. And that's terrific. And we could spend a whole episode on just the two of you. But Professor, there's something over your shoulder that uh, has been intriguing me the whole time that, that we've switched camera to you. What is that? What are, what are you advertising over there? One of the things that the students do, we talk about how to publicize our tour. And this is the poster. This is from this year. And these are things that the students are asked to use all of their skills, things they learn in other classes or just interests they have. And then we went out and we posted this poster around East Nashville and um, I mailed it to parties that I thought would be interested up in Nashville and, and people around here in Murfreesboro um, to advertise our tour. Well, Professor, thank you so very much for sharing all of this information with us and talking about this great course Audrey, best of luck to you. You're graduating senior in December. Hope to see you on campus soon. Congratulations to you both, and thanks for joining the program. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And that does wrap up another edition of Out of the Blue. You can find more stories and videos about the campus 24 hours a day by visiting our website, mtsunews.com. And a reminder, go to mtsu.edu slash coronavirus for the latest news and information on our preparations and responses regarding COVID-19. We also invite you to follow MTSU on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for additional special content. I'm Andrew Ottman. Stay on course, stay safe, and remain true blue.